everybody. Hello, hello. I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, slideshow during, during our lunch break. We had uh, all the recipients of our service awards uh, this year, right? Uh, going through some slides in terms of years of service. And again, Thursday. 3.30 Cascade Room to honor those who have given many years, in some cases more years than some of you have lived already, to this institution. That's kind of staggering. I'm starting to feel old. Um, also, we had the pictures of our new staff and faculty, so hopefully you enjoyed that. So what's going to start this afternoon um, off will be a conversation with uh, Dr. Mason and, and me. And uh, we've got a lot of things planned for the afternoon. I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. Mason and see what happens here. <laughs> so I'm really excited about our conversation. Um, as I said, I think that what's really important is that um, you, um, the head, in, head of the institution, taking the lead on this important work. Um, and I thought this morning was amazing. Uh, and the students were amazing. So I just wanted to hear from you what you thought about the morning and some takeaways that you, you might have. Well, one of my takeaways was profound relief that everyone came. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and just being so happy to see so many people here. There are a couple of takeaways. Um, so oftentimes when we think about this topic of student success and we talk about it around student differences or differences among student populations. Um, I, I think we enjoy, I, I know I certainly do on, at times, talk about it on an academic level as if there's a micro and a macro level of analysis. And in fact, we, we talked about this as we, as we were planning this day um, for the college. And knowing that there are individual variables that do impact um, the journey of one's life but also recognizing that there are institutional systems or there are systems that are institutions that um, can have an impact, whether supportive or hindering. But the one thing I would say that I took away this morning in the context of all our topics was the significance of connections and the, fortune, the good fortune that you had in second grade with Ms. Slaughter or was it Mrs. Slaughter, Ms. Slaughter, who said, Nicole, you're smart. And I think about how many Nicoles are out there who got that message and those who did not. And it was sort of serendipity that you were in her class. And she thought that one moment to take the time to say that. And I heard that resonating in our students' comments. And I've heard many people talk about the significance of a single individual and what that individual can mean in a person's life. And you have several opportunities within your life to have noted that in your, in your story. And I know many of us have had those opportunities. But as Yuri Treisman has said, who was a math, math faculty member and studies uh, developmental math, we should not have these moments be accidental. They need to be intentional. So that when we stop any student at our campus and we ask them the question, do you belong here? The immediate answer is yes, yes I do. And if we were to ask them, can you name at least one person who would care if you did not come back tomorrow, they could list at least one person. But to not have these accidental moments, not have these, oh I was lucky, I ran into the right person at the right time moments, but that this would be something that we intentionally structure within our systems. And that's what I've been really resonating around in my head, because we talked about our completion levels, and yet we hear the connectedness that Nicole shares, we hear the connectedness that the students are sharing with us. How can we scale that? How can we make that intentional ways of behaving at a volume that brings more of the students to these tables, saying the same things these students have said, and brings more Nicole's to the podiums in their future. That's, That's a great answer. Really That's why you're president. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I don't think so. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 if that's helpful, then, then that's great. Yeah. And then thinking about, um, so we, we've been in conversation for the last several months, but yesterday when we're, or this morning actually, when we're walking over here, um, you said that this day wouldn't have been possible a year ago. And, um, and I think last year was your first opening day. So could you talk about the journey from that day to here and um, getting us to thinking about these issues? Sure. You know, and, and I've shared some, and I know faculty and staff had an opportunity to have some dinner with you last night, and we'll have some social opportunity, you know, reception after this day, today here on campus, about some of the more recent past at the institution and the challenges and trials that, that many went through. And <clears throat> when there is a lack of trust, and when there's a lack of communication, when there is a lack of respect, um, people become frightened, and they become full of fear. And we are all creatures, we're living creatures, and what we do in the context of fear and, and crisis is we survive and we become defended um, and we can turn at each other um, when there would be sometimes better ways to be, right? But we're surviving. And I think the institution went through a difficult time internally and it caused some lost time on, on some levels where Maybe some were able to think about um, other issues, other institutions that did not have the internal conflicts, um, were able to have conversations that we're having now and we've had over this past year. And we've gone through a resettling. And I think when I joined this wonderful college last year, there was cautious optimism, there was cautious hope, but a lot of insecurity and a lot of uncertainty as to whether things could get settled in a way that would allow the faculty and staff to now come to work each day for the reasons they joined the college in the first place. And I think that was resonated in a, in a meeting yesterday. Jenny, I hope you don't mind me quoting you um, at Instructional Council. Um, and she shared a similar thought like that, which was we're, we're eager and ready to get, get more focused and back to the work we all wanted to do. And we have done and we struggled to do during the harder times, but now with support, it's possible. The other thing that I also think makes this day possible and have the engagement is that we have made a commitment to each other. We have invested in each other in mutual respect and trust and, re and regard. I think no matter what our differences are, we all want to be heard. We all want to be listened to. We want validation for our importance in this journey. And we all contributed to that work this past year. And we had some tough conversations at different times. And we talked about many things around student success and student retention. And all through that time, the trust and the stability grew. And I think we're at a place where everyone knows or is getting to know their value, their worth at this institution and the importance that we all play although I have a position or I have positionality that gives me some privilege, um, in the end, our success as an institution is based on all of the people out here. And I need to listen to them to know how to best serve their needs to do what they're here to do for our students. And I think the people are starting to believe that. Um, and I think that we're starting to take the best in each other for our future. That's great. So thinking about um, the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and thinking about where Green River is right now and the, the commitment um, to this day and, and centering around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and thinking about where the institution wants to go from here, do you have any ideas or thoughts about how you think this work might grow and continue? I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I know the audience has, has uh, probably many more ideas about how this work would, would grow. I've said, and many people have said this year, and I know we talked about it um, yesterday when you were here and we were walking around, and I said, you know, 
One of the most important things about tomorrow is on the one hand, it is a standalone moment. On the other hand, it's a continuation of a conversation that will go on and on. It is a journey. We will never be done with work around diversity and equity. We will never be done making our community, our culture that students come in and out of as inclusive as it can be. It is exponential and infinite in terms of the work. But what if I were to say to the college right now that I believe with intentionality we could probably double our completion rates in the next five to seven years, double them through being the best college we can be and focusing on the things that we know will work and drive home those connections with students. What would you say? Could we do it? Yes. Are we in it? Yes. All right. So in my mind, in the context of vision, I believe Green River College can double their completion rates in five to seven years. The reason why I say five to seven is it usually takes about three years to see any effect really, and then a couple more years to get solidly set. We spent a year last year talking about town halls, topics around student success and retention, and it was clear as could be, everybody could see what it is we need to do. What we have to do is organize our efforts around advising, around placement and testing, around acceleration out of college readiness around clarity of pathways so students know what do I have to take, how long will it take me to get there, and how much is it going to cost. These are things which are completely in our controls, above and beyond how students come to us. And I know, and I have to just take a side note here, you're faculty, I've been faculty most of my life, and I know we've got a lot of faculty out here. Let me be very clear about what doubling completion rates doesn't mean. It does not mean that we lower academic standard. It does not mean we do not maintain rigor. It does not mean that we do not deliver the college level curriculum that we know and you are trained and educated to do must be for our college's reputation as an academic institution. That is not what I mean. And we need to hold on to that because it's so often and so easy to be misinterpreted and misunderstood in terms of what it would mean to, to make our numbers look different. There are structural institutional policies and procedures which we can address, which is completely in our control that we must laser focus down onto now. So can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Unless you wanted to have a follow-up yeah. on that. So if I were to ask you, because this afternoon it's about the, the macro, right? If I were to ask you how, how we do examine equity and build a student-centered learning and community as an institution, what would you say the first steps would be? So I think that... Um, Creating a student-centered uh, student culture and an institution requires, is, is co-created, right? So it's co-created with students, it's co-created with faculty, you, staff, um, it's a joint effort. And so um, it has to be, everything has to drive, drive together. Um, so I think this part of the conversation is critically important so that you sitting here um, investing time and resources and starting the conversation and sparking the conversation is the first part. Um, the second part is what you've already been doing, um, is benchmarking um, and benchmarking where you are um, and then identifying obtainable goals, like you say 50, so, so I'm, I'm thinking that's, you're saying 54%. I am right, saying so 54% in five to seven years. Um, and so, if 54% is the goal, how do we benchmark that? How do we start and look at that? And what, what does that mean? Does that mean um, what might we have to do 
to get there. So it might be, um, I know that you're hi hiring faculty. Do we need diverse, um, you know, more diverse faculty? Right. Um, do, um, do we need to uh, be thinking about how students are engaged and what the touch points are. Um, we heard a lot here from the students and how they feel engaged and the faculty um, they, they identified with and that was really critical. And how do we um, provide professional development for faculty who um, may or may not know how to engage students in a particular way? Mm -hmm. um, how do we, what professional development opportunities might there be? Um, at the institutional level, like looking at some of the things you said about the pathways, is it easy? If you come in, like the, the, there was a, a young woman, I believe that it was um, Vanessa, who said, you know, I was taking all these courses and then I realized it wasn't going to get me to where I was going to go, so I changed my, you know, my path, you know, my, my, uh, my focus so that I could get there. And it's like, well, this woman has wasted not wasted, no, wasted is not the right word, <laughs> but this woman has spent a significant amount of time on a ladder that she maybe shouldn't have been on. And so um, clarity of processes, um, thinking about um, how transparent are the systems to students, um, I think is really important. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, like I said, it, you know, it's, it's very simple, it, you know, it's about belonging and feeling connected and making sure that um, just like we talk about, I talk about building a connected community, I think Green River is a community and making that as connected and as integrated as possible. It's really important. I wanted to pick up on one of the things you shared about faculty and uh, Human Resources, thank you for getting me this information last minute yesterday as I was thinking about things I'd like to share out today if they happen to come up and thank you for prompting me for that. Um, we have had a lot of faculty hiring. And in fact, uh, last year we had 18 new full-time faculty tenure track hired. This year we have nine new tenure track uh, faculty coming in with six searches that are still ongoing. They, they didn't complete last year. So if we do the math, that would be 15 ultimately this, in the past two years on, on top of the 18. And the three years before that we had 35 new tenure track faculty. Green River has the third largest number of full-time faculty in our 34 college system. And we are the third largest in enrollment. When, when I think about a day like this, and knowing that part-time faculty are included as well, um, which will never change again, um, in terms of not including them, what, I, what I'm struck with is the opportunities that we've been able to provide so far and the opportunities we need to provide, future-oriented. And I see today as a day of professional development for everyone here, faculty and staff, myself included. We're all here in terms of professional development, and it's necessary. One of the students on the panel today, I was able to speak with the student leaders uh, a few days ago, and uh, she had brought up, and I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting her name. She, was, uh, she brought up the issue of uh, gender pronouns. Anne. Anne. Thank you. And uh, I was at to ask, uh, taking questions from the students um, as we were chatting some. And she said, what, what, what can you do to help faculty who refuse to, to address students by their preferred pronoun? And it really struck me on a very personal level because I had I had never given that much consideration. My educational background, although it was psychology, um, and you would think that would be a domain um, that would have been all over that kind of concept, the, the, the civil rights movements of, of trans people and uh, non-binary identities is relatively new. I had to learn on a personal level as a mother the significance of pronouns, because um, my younger child is trans and is in the process of, of transitioning now from female to male. It had never occurred to me. And what I shared with her was that all of us as individuals, we come to these institutions with our competencies of your faculty, you have expertise within a content area, but you may not have had the opportunities to know all things that might be so salient to the students in our classrooms. And that is, that is my and the administration and the staff's responsibility and faculty's responsibility to do two things. Identify the areas that we need growth in and learning opportunities in, and to find ability and venue and resource to provide it. 
when we invest in ourselves, we honor the students, and we further our, our cause. So it is something that we need to contemplate, and it is something that we need to reflect on. We have had a lot of faculty retirements and a lot of faculty hiring. There, there is a circle of life happening <laughs> in terms of faculty. And it's something for us to, to be proud of and to celebrate and, and have our connected communities, continue to build our connected communities so that we stay connected as the newness comes with more people, more views, more ways of doing, so that we are together for those students so they can't fall through a web that we have. Okay. So I have one other question. What is the individual's role in helping build an inclusive and equitable learning environment? Well, I mean, I think you just spoke to it a, a little bit. I think that we each have our, a responsibility to understand where our blind spots are and where there is a need for professional development. I think that's one thing. And I also think that because, uh, especially at a large campus, um, it's easy to get siloed and uh, to not know um, faculty in other departments or even staff. And so have, taking it upon, you know, and taking individual responsibility to break out of your silo and to make connections across departments and across uh, with, sta with staff um, so that if there is a student that needs support, um, you know where to send them and you feel comfortable picking up the phone to say, hey, I have a student here and she needs this resource or, 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 or help. Um, I think that's, that's critically important. And, you know, I think that, again, like I said before, in, in the larger, in, in the, the Q&A, um, that we are all creating the culture here. And so if we're working to shift the culture, we have to be thinking about the moving as a wave. So it really shifts and so that no one's left behind. Mm -hmm. um, and being patient with people um, who don't have the background or don't have the training and are just beginning to think about these issues because if we think about it as a continuum, um, some of us have been, who, who live our lives at the intersections, um, you know, we deal with this on, we deal with some of these issues on a daily basis um, and, or have been working in um, diversity, equity, inclusion. We, you know, we can talk about implicit bias and microaggressions and intersectionality and all the, with ease, but there's some people where that's just not their lane, or that's just not their experience. And so um, being generous and gracious, um, and I think being open to the, the process and making sure that everybody comes along. Okay, so I have a, a visioning question, because you posed one for our students. If you were able to come back to Green River three, four years from now, oh, and by the way, Dr. Mason has graciously agreed to come back in the winter term for the one book author events. Um, so, <laughs> <I'm> excited. <laughs> um, if you were to come back three to four years from now, what would you hope for Green River College to be? Well, I mean, Three to five years, uh, so you're going to have some new faculty hires. Three to five more, years, more, even more, more, <laughs> more, more faculty hires. Um, I would really like to see a little, uh, you know, some of those faculty hires be pe uh, faculty of color. I think that would be awesome. Um, um, I was, uh, I was telling Rolita today about a, um, a dashboard. Um, that was, uh, I think it's either Stanford or Yale, they created this really, they've been doing a lot of deep work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and they benchmark where they are, sort of like you've done. Um, and over the three or five years, they've m managed and tracked the progress on a range of issues, whether it's uh, student engagement, um, professional development, faculty hires, staff hires, um, uh, whatever the range of benchmarks you want to have and then, you know, starting zero or wherever they were and then you could see over time, three to five years, the progress that they've made on those, those, those measures. And I think that's really important because one, because I, 
because sometimes you, 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 you're doing the work, but you don't see things changing fast enough, and so you think the work isn't happening. But if there's a way for the, for the whole college to go to a dashboard or click on something and say, this is where we are here, um, and so that there's accountability, um, and there's also transparency. Um, so some sort of system that um, looks at those things. Uh, I think it would be really, really awesome and amazing if there was some professional development opportunities identified for faculty and staff, or even a resource or, or a bucket of dollars where they can tap into uh, to attend conferences and um, training opportunities outside of Green River so that, um, again, and so they can bring it back and share it with the, the community. Um, I mean, those are some of the things. I mean, okay, I think we're going to we're going to have to have you back three yeah. to five years from now yeah, okay. to see how we're doing. Yeah. Um, so this is a perfect time, I think, then to segue and get down to work. Um, I'm so excited to see so many people still here. I didn't know what was going to happen after lunch. Um, we're going <laughs> we're going to transition now to our activities, and I'm going to get off the stage, and Nicole's going to. Uh, take over. Oh, we'll sorry. get the uh, PowerPoint up for Nicole, Chris up there, and Peter. And uh, Nicole's going to take us through an activity all together as a group. And um, let's just take it from there. Thank you so much for the conversation. Okay. I got to get down. So I'm just going to buy a little time. <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna do this activity um, around. I'm back. Well, actually, I'm not even gonna say what it is. It probably says it on the agenda. I'll let Nicole talk talk about it. <laughs> okay. Do I have a clicker? Where's the clicker? Yep. So this is gonna be great and amazing for our last uh, uh, couple hours together. Is it hour hour and a half? Um, so before we get started with this exercise, I just wanted to talk about a few of our agreements for our time together. Um, and um, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. So the first is so we're going to be having this big group discussion, and then we're going to break into table groups, and then we're going to share out um, a few times. So the first agreement is to share the space and step up, step back. Um, the second is to stay curious, um, and by that I just mean if you don't understand or agree with something that's being said, um, try to investigate the feeling, what's being triggered, and to be open and ask clarifying or follow-up questions. So this, the third one is to support colleagues in their journey. For some of us who've been working on issues related to diversity and inclusion or who live at the intersections, so. Some of what we're going to talk about may seem like old hat, but I ask you to support your colleagues and bring your expertise to the table and help us to guide the courageous conversations that I think we'll have today. Um, the fourth agreement is acceptance and allowance of diverse perspectives and processing styles. We don't all arrive at the same conclusion at the same time, um, so just you know, being aware of that. And then think well of each other. Uh, attitude of openness, cooperation, and respect. This is not the White House. Nobody's there to record you, get you wrong. Um, so, and so we're all here for the same reason. Um, are there any other others to add? Community agreements? No? Great. We can just move on here. So, oh, this was for going to be before we went to lunch. So, let's talk about extraterrestrials. <laughs> talk about extraterrestrials. Um, so, where's my, this? So, got it. Let's talk about extraterrestrials. Can you describe an extraterrestrial for me? What do they look like? What do they look like? Anybody? Are they big heads? 
So big head. Huh? Antennas. Antennas. That right? Green. Somebody said green. Big eyes. Big eyes. <laughs> telepathic. Ooh, telepathic. Huh? Knowledge to save the human race. Wow. Destroy or destroy it. Maybe they want to destroy the human race. Save or de and or destroy. Destroy human race. What? Oh, they are they smarter than us? They may be smarter than us. They're smart. I'm gonna put er. Um. Uh, what they kind of have like. Skinny legs, right? Right? Skinny legs and arms. So, what about their, maybe those little hands that look like pods? They like stick to you? Pod fingers. What else? <laughs> How do you, Reese's Pieces? Remember what? What were the aliens? Uh, the the they they drank milk. An alien. Remember they drank the milk. Is that true? The curdled milk? No, I don't know. Nobody remembers that movie. No. V. Remember V. <laughs> um, remember Alf? Was he an asteroid? Um, uh, what might they do to you? What might an alien do, uh, extraterrestrial do to you? <laughs> what might they do? They might, they might teleport you up, you know, remember, you know, there's always a fear of a kidnapping there. They control your brain. <laughs> Study you, right? They put you those little things on your body. But they never eat you. That was never a threat. They didn't eat humans, I don't feel. Or did they? Or did they? Yes. Sigour oh, Sigourney Reaver. <laughs> Oh, they want to take over. Frankly, we're going to be all slaves, right? Because when they come, they're going to enslave us all. Okay, so they want to take over the planet. But on the Jetsons, that wasn't the case. They just, they lived, we lived happy. We lived together. We coexisted. Um, what other things might they try to do to us? They might try to kill us. Ooh. Yeah, kill us. Destroy us. Kill, destroy. So, what else? We have anything now? Live among us. They want to live among us. Oh, all those ones that, like, what are those called when they become like the human body? Body snatchers? My God. Right? So, by show of hands, how many people have ever seen an extraterrestrial in real life? No, nobody. No, not one. So if none of us have ever seen an extraterrestrial, how do we know so much about them? 
We remember the great gazoo? Uh, you know, Flintstones. Like this guy, this is when the Flintstones jumped the shark, when, you, when like the great gazoo got, you know, like, <laughs> where's this guy coming from? Um, um, or, you know, E.T., little E.T., nobody said E.T. Or that guy is the one that we see. We, that, like, that is like Mr. Extraterrestrial, that guy. Um, so how we get our information about extraterrestrials is through TV, the media, stories, um, and we believe it. We believe it. That is what implicit bias is, right? So implicit bias refers to the attitudes, stereotypes that affect our understanding or actions or decisions in an unconscious manner. It includes favorable and unfavorable assessments. So it's all, that th all those things happening at once. So although we've never seen an alien or an, an extraterrestrial, we kind of have in our minds what they look like, what they might do to us, um, the color of their head, they don't have any hair, all these things we know. But in fact, none of us have ever seen an extraterrestrial. No, before this. So when we think about microaggressions, right, and the relationship between implicit bias and microaggressions, um, implicit bias are those attitudes that you hold subconsciously, right? So for example, I'm going to give you another example of implicit bias. If you're watching television and you have your back turned to it and so you're just listening to it, and there's an armed robbery, somebody, the reporter's describing an armed robbery, and your back is turned, you already have in your mind who you think committed the crime. You only turn around to the TV to confirm or deny what you already believe, right? So it's like that. So when we think about microaggressions and um, implicit bias related to the extraterrestrial, you already have in your mind what an extraterrestrial looks like. And if an extraterrestrial walked into the room and you said something like, wow, you said something like, wow, I, your head is pretty small. I thought your head would be bigger. <laughs> and then the extraterrestrial was like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, I just thought that alien, you know, extraterrestrials had big heads. Um, that's an example of a microaggression related to um, the example of an extraterrestrial. And this is another example of implicit bias that we, again, when we're thinking about implicit bias and how unconscious it is, we don't often think about it and we don't think about the media's role in helping us and bombarding us with these messages. So um, in the first example, we're gonna use Hurricane Katrina and looting or finding. The first guy is swimming in the water and it says, a young man walks through chest deep water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday. So, Okay, you know, you just, again, it's unconscious, you just let it go. Same news source. Two residents wade through the chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina. They're doing the same thing. Um, and so we can see here that all, some, of the, some of the things that, that, as we can see here, that when we think about implicit bias, it's subconscious. Like, if these two things weren't connected or on top of each other, you might not notice the two different things. And we can also notice, we can also note that the media and society plays a role in what we perceive, what we think about groups, our understanding of groups, um, and that we all have it and we all internalize um, consciously or subconsciously um, some of these things and stereotypes about different groups. So, the link between microaggressions and implicit bias. Microaggressions are comments or actions that subtly, subtly and often unconsciously or intentionally express a prejudiced attitude toward a member of a marginalized group, such as a racial or ethnic minority. So they could include verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights, snubs, whether intentional or intentional. And so when you hear, and you probably hear it in your classroom or you've heard it before, um, when someone says something like, um, I think Daniel, 
Daniel's example today on the stage was a perfect example when he was talking about um, his name. Um, and he said, you know, why do I have to have a Western name? Uh, and um, and, and that's, a, that's an example of a microaggression that seems very slight and minor, but has a really damaging impact and again, creates separation and a feeling of not belonging. Um, so what we're gonna do is that you have in your packet a sheet. It's called the Trusted Ten. So I want you to pull it out. So what I don't want you to do is open up the flap that everybody did. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but I knew you guys kind of do that. I would have had to staple them closed. But. So what I want you to do, um, there's a, on the left column, it says to trust a 10. I want you to take three or four minutes to list the people you believe are part of your trusted 10. Um, try to exclude family members. You know, put your mom, your dad, you know, your <laughs> uncle, you know, come on. <laughs> so we're not gonna collect the sheets so you can write, you know, I don't know, whoever you wanna write. Um, but just take four minutes to list the people you believe are part of your trusted ten. After you've written your top ten, open the flap. And so you'll see a number of categories, dimensions of identity. And so what I want you to do is to look at your top ten and then code them. Right? So if, um, you know, it says gender. You could uh, write if the person is male, female, gender nonconforming, trans, non-binary. Um, you can come up with your own system as you go through the categories. Education, you might do high school, GED, um, college, professional degree, however you want to code. Do we need a minute or so? Or are we still? Okay. So what I want you to do is in your table group, I want you to think about two questions or two things. I want you to think about what do you notice about your top 10? Um, and what about the people who are not in your top 10? So think about who's in your top 10. What are they in terms of their backgrounds in relationship to you? Are they the same? Are they different? Um, and I want you to um, talk about it for a couple minutes with your table, and then we'll come back together. Before we move on, I'm wondering if there are, if there's anybody who'd want to share out about their top 10 and any observations that they made, any brave soul? Does anybody want to share out any aha moments about their list or their? I mean, what do you mean by that? Right. So, so I, I mean, I trust a lot of people, but that doesn't mean I actually have a trusting or or I go to them or I they know anything about me. But they, you know, like I trust Liz, you know, um, but I never go to Liz and load her with my tragedies of my life. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> But, so you know what I mean, so when, it's, it's, it was very hard to identify people outside of your family that you trust just because what does that mean, at what level, mm -hmm. right? What is, so when, so I think, 
we, we were realizing that we have a hard time with uh, uh, multiple choices or you know fill in the blank or whatever. Wow. Because uh, <laughs> I mean, I have to spend hours now thinking about the word trust. trust. What does that mean, right? <laughs> Academics. This is it. This is how you. This is what happens. Like trust. What do you mean? So, uh oh, sorry. So, I want to think of it like this, right? So the people. So if we have three rings here, right? I don't know if you can see this. So if you have three rings. The first ring are people like acquaintances, right? People um, that you, you're, sometimes your colleagues that you just say hi or you, you, know, you pass on campus. Um, they're acquaintances. This is probably the most diverse, probably. Like, you know, there are a lot of people that you say hi to and, you know, church or, you know. Um, and it's, pr it's pretty big. Then you get to the second, second ring. Um, they start to be a little less diverse, the second ring. Um, but, you know, they might be Liz. You know, you might say a little thing, you know, a few things to her, but, you know, not everything. Um, uh, and so it starts to thin out here. When you get to the third ring, this is your trusted, this is who you go to when you have an issue, a problem. And um, how many people found that the people in this circle were kind of like you? Right? They're mostly like you. Right? So they, they tend to have the same educational background, they team, seem to have the same religion or interest or whatever the markers are. Those are the people that we tend to gravitate towards. So, um, and we all, you know, these are not the people who we invite. Number one, we don't invite these people to uh, Christmas, probably not, right? Um, um, maybe some people in two might get an invitation, but we all know who these people are, right? So, um, and we tend to gravitate people towards people who share our worldview, perspective, in some instances our background, and we also tend to favor people who are like this and have and share uh, similar characteristics. Um, there are two reasons why this is important in terms of our work here. The first is that when we can relate to someone or see ourselves reflected back to us, we are more likely to extend ourselves or to go the extra mile and help and try to solve a problem with them. Um, when we don't feel connected or struggle to understand a, stand a person's experience or perspective, we're less inclined to help and or problematize the person. Like something must be wrong with you if I don't understand what's going on or why don't you just do this. When we have a diversity of students coming through our doors, the chances of engaging with students who do not share our same set of circumstances or outside of our trusted 10 is high. So even some of the students that I gravitate towards, they, you know, um, they look like me or they, they, you know, they're progressive or, you know, I, you know, I'm like, wow, I see myself in that young person. And so even thinking about how I might stretch myself, I was telling somebody the other day, I have this new student, this guy in my class, I call him Contrary Mary, um, because every time I say something, he says the opposite. Um, so, um, and so thinking about the ways in which I too have to stretch and think about the ways that, that I too am connected to Contrary Mary, even though I do not think I am. Um, and so thinking about that. And so I want to talk about the connection between implicit bias and higher education before we go on to our table conversations. So again, in higher education, implicit bias often refers to the unconscious racial bias, racial or socioeconomic bias towards students. Um, instructors and staff can hold assumptions about students' learning behaviors and their capability for academic success which are tied to students' identities and or backgrounds. And these assumptions can impede student success. So here are a few examples. Um, so instructors may expect students who speak with certain accents to be poor writers. Um, students with substandard writing abilities may be stereotyped as, looking, as lacking intellectual ability. Um, staff may assume that students from a particular ethnic group enjoy specific foods or drinks. So I don't know if you remember the NYU debacle maybe a couple months ago where the, uh, for Black History Month, they served watermelon and chicken. Um, do you guys not know? So you gotta, you know. West Coast. What, you, huh? <laughs> it's it's just, West Coast, we might not have all gotten it. Yeah, so it was really horrible. Um, hmm? 
No, she's saying you all are on the West Coast. And so it, it may not have gotten this far, or, you know. Um, um, and again, and it's sort of like, uh, you know, and so when the students are like, what, what is going on here? It's like, what are you talking about, you know? Um, assuming students who are parents are not capable of fully participating in campus life. So not, you know, not extending the invitation to an event or a function because you assume that there's other caretaking demands or responsibilities that might prevent them from participating. Um, instructors might treat students with physical dis disabilities as if they al may, may also have mental disabilities and thus require more attention. So these examples, when we talk about creating an environment or student-centered culture where all students feel like they belong, um, and it's, it's not these big macro things, because that's not how we operate. Everything, it's not as overt or explicit, but it's the small things that contribute to whether students feel like they belong um, here. So with that, what we're gonna do, and I'm really excited about, is to talk about some of the macro and institutional ways that we can create a stronger student-centered culture and um, you know, strengthen our efforts around diversity, equity, inclusion here at Green River. Right, and fortunately, because before we get into this tabletop stuff, we have our second 15 minute break, which allows me to say we adhered to the contractual requirements. <laughs> <laughs> so from two to 2.15 now, uh, we have a break and at 2.15, let's get everybody back to the tables because we're gonna go into some rounds of tabletop activities and report outs and some more work. So our second 15 minute break, coming right up. Enjoy your time for the bathroom, a little fresh air. 2.15, back to the tables.